Now this morning, you're joining us in the fourth message of a series that we've entitled Countering Culture, Courage to Go Against the Culture. And it's a series through the first six chapters of the Old Testament book, the book of Daniel. So if you have a Bible or a device by which you can access the Bible, love for you to turn to the third chapter of Daniel. That's where we'll be this morning. This morning, we'll encounter the lives of three of Daniel's friends. How many friends? Three. What chapter are we in? Three. Great. Now, we know these men by the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And here's what we'll see. They are going to face an intense situation where their faith and the culture around them are like oil and water. Did you know that you lived in a time in this country in the 40s and 50s where the cultural values and the biblical values that we share were a little bit like peanut butter and jelly? They somewhat aligned. Did you recognize now that where you live it is no longer like that? The values of the world and the values of God's word are a bit more like oil and water. So, last week, as we finished chapter 2, we saw how Daniel, how Daniel processed and responded when he was confronted with an unexpected, an uncertain, and a scary situation. Anyone ever had one of those this week? That was unexpected. Chapter 3, where we are today, we'll see how Shad, Rack, and Benny, that's how we'll call these boys for today, how they process, how they respond in an unexpected and uncertain and a scary situation. Why? Because by nature of being a child of God, their values do not align with the world's values. Therefore, culture and faith collide, oil and water. So how do they respond? That'll be what we learned this morning. Let me ask you a question. What chapter are we in today? Three. How many men are we considering today? Three. Therefore, I will share three lessons, I believe, that lend themselves as a clear example of how to counter culture, how when we, as individuals who follow Jesus, there's three things that we'll see in this text from these three men from the third chapter of Daniel, if I can have your attention, that are helpful to you if you'll use them. Don't allow them to be lost on you. Don't allow them to be lost. But I pray this week that you step into them, that you find them as helpful tools, guidelines and guardrails for how you navigate when things collide in your family culture, your work culture, with your faith. Today, I think I'm going to read from the New King James. It's a great, great translation. And we will be reading through Daniel chapter 3. And I'd like to start by reading a lot of Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. So if you have a Bible before you today, we won't have those verses on the screen. So I'd encourage you to have your device or your analog version of the Bible in front of you. Verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits, and its width was six. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon, and King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, all those important people, verse 3, satraps, administrators, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, all the officials of the provinces, what'd they do? Well, they gathered together 
for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute and harp and lyre and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that the king Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. This is a tough Monday, right? That's what's happening here. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of these instruments in symphony, with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 8. At that time, certain Chaldeans came forward. And what did they do? They accused the Jews. They spoke and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn and flute harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Well, yeah, that's the rule. Look at verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid you due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Let me give you a little bit of context here. Earlier in the book, we were first introduced to King Nebuchadnezzar. Believe it or not, this is not a fairy tale king. You can dive into the books of history and read about him. Now, Daniel had revealed and interpreted a vision in chapter 2 of a multi-metallic image, a statue. Nebuchadnezzar was an idolater. Therefore, God met him right where he was, gave him a dream of an idol. In that dream, in that vision, Nebuchadnezzar, he was a head of gold. Now, you wouldn't know this if you're just casually reading through the Bible, but there are actually 16 years of time between chapter 2 and chapter 3. 16 years. A lot can happen in that amount of time. Would you agree? You can go from no kid to driver's license kid. That's a, that's a big change. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was told that he was the head of gold. So what does he do 16 years later? He makes a whole statue of gold. Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> oh, that guy. And it's huge. It's 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. Now, don't think Lincoln Memorial. Think Washington Monument if you're trying to put something in your mind's eye. This is what's in front of the people. And what does he do? He gets the best musicians. A rocking team together. All the key people are there. Daniel mentioned it more than once, the administrators and the governors. and I mean, this is the who's who. This is the Grammys. They're all there. And when the band plays, everyone must honor the king. If they don't, they're dead, thrown into a fiery furnace. Well, Rad, Shack, and Benny, what do they do? They don't do it. They hear, they see, they're surrounded. There's no ambiguity in what's expected, but they don't follow. What's one lesson we can learn? Here's the first of three for today. Encountering culture, I think we should choose to be good in example, not good in excuses. Good in example, not good with excuses. So what do you mean by that? Everyone's bowing down. This is the moment where faith and culture collide. If there was ever a moment, I would say, to begin to rationalize 
the commands of God, maybe, wouldn't you agree that maybe now's the time? The king is hot, the furnace is hot, and if they don't obey, they'll be not, right? They're going to be incinerated. There is a great temptation, I would assume, to rationalize, to begin to make excuses for a lack of obedience. Have you ever been there? These are three Jewish boys, good Jewish boys. They know the heart of God, the commands of God. They know they're called to obey God. They knew Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Well, what was that? You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness or anything that's in heaven or on earth below or that's in water underneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Let me ask you a question. Does it seem like pretty clear for them, the choice that they're supposed to make here? Pretty clear. But set yourself in their sandals. They're standing there with the heat of blazing, fiery furnace in their face. And they've got everything to lose. Everything to lose. Set yourself in this story. They have been there now for close to 20 years. These are not unknown men. They've got a good reputation. They've got a good position. They've worked hard. They probably have a little bit of a 401k saved, right? They may even have a boat by now. And everything's up for grabs. If we follow God now, we will lose everything we have. They could have been thinking, huh, well, maybe this is a perfect scenario for situational ethics. Anyone ever heard that term? In this situation, it would be all right to bow down because we'll get killed if we don't. And certainly God would not want us, his young men, whom he has raised up, to die, would he? Of course not. In this scenario, it must be okay to go against what God wants. Or maybe they could have made a cultural case for it. The Babylonians aren't going to understand the laws of God. We don't want to offend the culture and ruin our opportunity for a witness. Here's what we'll do. We'll bow down now so they'll listen to us later. Besides, no one we know is even going to see this. Maybe they could have rationalized with God's forgiveness. Ever been in that place? Could have said, we have a loving God who is slow to anger and quick to forgive, will just bow this one time. One time. God will forgive us. The Babylonians, they won't. <laughs> so in this situation, this makes sense. They could have been tempted to make a silent protest. What is that? Well, we'll kneel on the outside, but in our hearts, we're worshiping the true God. In our hearts, and God knows our hearts, God understands. They could have come up with a thousand different excuses. I just got to be honest with you. I can do the same thing. How about you? Reminds me of that famous phrase by Benjamin Franklin, the one who is good with excuses is seldom good with anything else. In your life, it will serve you well to understand the difference between an explanation and an excuse. And don't confuse the two. There's always an explanation for a reason. But the one that's good with excuses... Let me share this. You have potential. I believe God's gifted you. He's wired you. He's called you. He's resourced you for, for good things. For his glory and the good of others. Listen to me. You have potential, but potential has an expiration date. If you don't actualize that potential through the obedience to what God's placed upon your heart, you will sit on the shelf. And the one who is good with excuses will seldom be used by God. What is he looking for? Well, I, I think like this. Joshua 24, 14. Through 15, Joshua said this, Choose tomorrow who you will serve. Don't make a decision right now. No, no, no. Choose this day who you will serve. 
What about 2 Corinthians 3? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ. What does that mean? Well, some have put it this way. You're the only Bible some people will ever read, so be a good translation. When individuals look at your life, your ABCs, your attitudes, your beliefs, and your choices, do they go, that, that looks like a little Christ right there, a Christian. May we lead lives of example, an example of trust, an example of faith, an example of love. Forgiveness is hard when you've truly been offended, truly been wounded, and not by accident, but on purpose. But forgiveness is the pathway to freedom if you've been hurt, if you've been wounded, if you've been abused, if you've been neglected. And there will always be a reason to offer an excuse of why you and I can't forgive, why we can't move on. But please do not confuse what an explanation is in juxtaposition to what an excuse is. God's desire for you is that you walk in freedom. Forgiveness is the pathway to freedom. But the choice is yours. Will I walk in freedom or will I not? Here's the first uh, helpful statement from chapter 3. Choose to be good in example, not good with excuses. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar finds out that Radshak and Benny aren't bowing, so what happens? Let's read verse 13 through verse 23. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was so understanding. Oh, in rage and in fury, <laughs> he gave the command, bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke. Man, listen to this. Don't miss this. The plot kind of thickens here. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you're ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn and flute and harp and lyre and psaltery and the symphony and all kinds of music, if you'll fall down, here's the second chance. If you'll fall down, if you're ready at the time you hear this sound, and worship the image I have made. Good. Well, let it go, boys. But if you do not, if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Listen to this statement. Doesn't it sound like Goliath a bit? And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Wow. This is intense. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Wow. No need. Okay, verse 17. If that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. The expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and spoke and commanded that the heat they furnace seven times more than it's usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound and their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire actually killed those who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, isn't it interesting how often these names are mentioned? It's like you want to remember these guys. Fell down into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. 
old gnarly Neb is angry. He has Rad, Shaq, and Benny brought before him. And here's the deal. He gives them a second chance. Gosh, doesn't this get tempting for these guys? They've already faced a temptation once. Now it gets even thicker and more challenging. They're before the king face to face. It's one thing to obey God in the midst of a crowd. Now they have to obey God in, in direct defiance to the king. Now, did you catch their response in verses 16 through 18? We don't even need to, we know what's happening here. There's no need for this. We know what we're going to do. How are they able to do this? Let me give you the second takeaway truth for today. We can stand when we settle things beforehand. You know, we all have habits. And I've heard before that a way a habit works is through these three ways. A cue, a response, and a reward. Anyone else heard of that? A couple of us? Chad's heard of it. Cue, response, and reward. Let me give you an example. I'll give you a positive example. The alarm goes off at 6 a.m. Your response you're up. Put some running shoes on. Go to the gym or go outside for a walk. You put some worship music on and you use that time to connect with the Lord and get your body moving. The cue, alarm clock. The response, I'm up and I'm ready and I'm going. The reward, spiritual and physical health. A negative. Let me give you a different example. I'll share one from my past. I could be somewhere anywhere, and have something that I'd love to speak with Cecilia Jane Spencer about. So I pick up this device called a phone, and I give her a call. No answer. Okay. So I'll shoot her a text. Uh, no response. Okay. Todd, so call her again. Another text, another call. I'm human. Anyone else in here human? Just a couple of us. I get a little frustrated. Here's what I say. Maybe this is my, uh, my situation. The cue is the phone isn't getting answered. The response, oh, it's just like Nebuchadnezzar, love and patience and kindness. No, I, I ask this question, why do we pay X amount of dollars a month for a phone that we don't use? Like, that's the response. And if I have the brilliance to actually verbalize that to my, my lovely wife, you know what the reward is for that? There is no reward, right? It's just something we like to call as Christians, intense fellowship ensues, right? That's what happens. Now, here's the point. Habits either work for you or against you, but they work all the time. Habits either work for you or against you, but they work all the time. Albert Einstein, most powerful force in the universe, compound interest. As you do something, over time, it brings a great impact. And that either works for you or against you. Here's the point. In the life of Rad, Shaq, and Benny, they had worked godly disciplines into their life, rhythms, so that when something came up, bow or burn, it wasn't like, dude, we got to fast and pray. We got to go seek a spiritual guru. What do we do? No, no, no. They already knew what to do. They could stand because they settled things, what? Beforehand. Beforehand, it was already settled. See, here's the deal. In our life, no matter what the cue is, when our response is a gospel response, a kingdom response, I believe you experience the very presence of God in that situation. And whatever you want most in life will be the thing that drives your habits. That's the way it works. In the short run, we all have excuses. Well, I can't do this right now because I got 18 kids and because I got no money and because I understand that. I get that. I don't got 18, but I got a third of that, right? Like, I get that. That in the short run of life, sometimes you can't engage in serving God in a meaningful way. But in the long run, well, that's your choice. That's your choice. And whatever you want most in life will be the things that drives your habits. But often what habit happens is we exchange what we want most for what we want in the moment. Anyone ever heard of Winn-Dixie BOGO? Do you know what that is? Like when the chips are on sale? Phew. 
I have a huge challenge in that department of my life. Like, oh, they're on sale. Maybe this is the Lord. You know, like, <laughs> it's not the Lord. It's marketing, and they know how to get you. They got me. Well, here's what I would say. Imagine what our lives would look like if we settled beforehand what our lives would look like as it relates to the kingdom of God. We can stand in the face of compromise and difficult situations when we settle things beforehand. They're settled. I already know this is a done deal. There's no question about this. Say, what do you mean by that? Let me give you the 10 for one of what is settled at Coastline Calvary Chapel. Say, what do you mean by that? The 10 for one. Number one, we believe that new life is found in Jesus. Anyone else believe that? Oh, good, eight, 18 of you. Uh, maybe, maybe there'll be 20 of you by the end of this. That'd be awesome. Two more people get saved and they believe that. New life is found in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's coming for you every single day. He's coming for you to steal from you, to kill, to destroy every single day. But Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. New life is found where, church? It rhymes with Jesus. That is settled for, for Coastline Calvary Chapel. That's not a question for us. That is where new life is found. There's also something else that's settled for us. Our four core values. Four core values. Yeah, remember I said 10 four, one I just gave you the one. New life in Jesus. Here's our four core values or our four core mission things or whatever you want to call them. Life. I already talked about that. New life in Jesus. Love. Community and purpose. Well, what is that? The gospel is where you find new life in Jesus. And then there's these things in Scripture called the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. The Great Commandment of God is that you would love Him. He wants to be with you, He doesn't want you to work for Him. He wants you to worship him. And the day that you realize that your work is your worship is the day that work has final meaning for you. Work does not define your value. Work is your platform through which to worship God, through the gifts and talents and abilities and skill sets that he's placed in your life. When you stray from that, work becomes hard. It doesn't mean it's not challenging every day. But God's desire for you is that you would love him. That's our, our second pillar. Life is found in him, and we just want to be with him. It's the great commandment. And then to love one another. The one who says they love God but hates their brother is a liar, James would say. And yet so many Christians, those that identify as Christian, and that's a value for them, May I share something with you? And this will be maybe not understood by many. I'm okay with that. I no longer value me having to identify as Christian. Oh, what do you mean by that? I value being identified as one who follows Jesus. Because that is the original way. In the first century early church, to be one who followed Jesus was called one of the way. I follow Jesus. And you know what happened as people started to follow Jesus? Other people started to identify these individuals as Christian. See, the identity of Christian should be something that others say about you, not something that you have to say, no, I'm Christian. No. Allow your choices and your character dictate your identity in front of others. Because see, here's the deal. If you'll make your character that which you go after hard and not your reputation... Your reputation will eventually take care of itself. You cannot control what others say or think or believe about you. You cannot. But you can control your character. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, not with everybody, because people are crazy. Have you ever met people? 
like, your character will eventually define your reputation. It'll speak for itself. And so, the four core missions of this church that are settled, life is found in Jesus. Life is about loving him. Life is about loving one another, connecting together, being in fellowship. And life is about living on mission. This is the good life. You know this about me. I have this addiction to alliteration. You know this. This is the good life. Gospel, gather, group, go. Life is found in Jesus, gospel. When we gather together, this does not exist for the one who is lost nor the one who is saved. A Sunday morning worship service exists for God. We're here to sing to him, to learn from him. But if it's about him, the disciple and the one who doesn't know Jesus, they tremendously benefit from it. But have you met people who think that church is all about them? Have you met those people? I didn't like the music. It's not for you. The music's for him. Well, I don't, I don't like these programs. Oh, these programs are about him. They're meant to benefit. But church, a gathering, this is what you're doing right now. There's, there's 10 pieces to it. Singing, praying, preaching, learning, serving, giving, communion, community, mission. These are the handles by which we step into a gathering and love God. Because love is an ambiguous term. Have you, have you ever discovered that in, in, in the world that we live in? Like every other song is written about it, but no one seems to know what it is. I think it's very clear that love is more about devotion than it is emotion. Love is more about choice than it is infatuation. And I believe you can love God rhythmically. You can choose to. You can sing to him because he deserves it. You can learn from his word because you love him. You can be in community because he's called you to do it. You can serve him and give to him as evidences of your love for him. These are not mystical. These are not hard to understand. These are things that you can choose to be good an example in, not good in excuses about. The good life is you, about the gospel. You gather. But listen, the goal of a church is not that everyone knows everybody. The goal of a church is that everybody is known. In a gathering, I mean, just take three seconds, look around. Are you going to know all these people? But if you get in a group of eight to ten people, there you go. You can be known. The gospel, gather, group, and go. Go. Go into your world and live on mission with the good news of Jesus. This is the good life. This is the God life. And these men had settled beforehand what they were going to do. And you got to love and respect and learn from how Rad, Shack, and Benny respond in a compromising situation. You see, if you look at verses 17 and 18, they do not doubt God's ability. But also, please listen to this. They do not assume to know God's will. This is a gold and a pearl of wisdom for my life and yours. Never doubt God's ability and never assume God's will. Sometimes we can get it wrong. We don't think God has the ability, but we think we know exactly what God is doing. And sometimes children die. I reached out to a dear friend this week whom one of my daughters is named after. And this week was her heaven's day. I said, hey, so-and-so, so-and-so, just thinking of and praying for you. And it's probably been what? How long? Ten years ago that she passed. Do I think that God willed that into existence? That No, I think that we live in a world that was created good, read Genesis, and then centered and entered the world. <laughs> And God is going to remake this world and make everything right once again. But now there's death. Now there's challenge. Now there's sorrow. And in God's infinite wisdom and discernment, he allowed that little girl to move from earth to heaven at age eight. That's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. How do you navigate that? 
Never doubt God's ability, but also never assume to know God's will. I know this can't be God's plan for this thing to happen. I'm just here to say, you don't know. You're on this side of eternity where, where the future is fuzzy and behind us is a little bit more clear. But you do have clarity of who God is and what he's able to do. So, what does it look like to counter culture and actually follow Jesus? Choose to be good in example, not good with excuses. You can stand if you settle things beforehand. Well, when Nebuchadnezzar hears of all this, he's furious, he binds them, gets the best of his men to throw them into the fire, but in the act of throwing them in, they die. And look at what happens in verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He arose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king, look, he answered and said, I see four men, and they're loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And then Nebuchadnezzar, he went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, uh, listen to how he changes his tune. Uh, Servants of the Most High God, (laughs) come out, come, come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and all those important people, they gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. Listen to this. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, And the smell of fire was not on them. Have you ever been to the melting pot? (laughs) I went there the other day. We used to go there every around this year because it's our my wife and I's uh, anniversary of engagement, and it's also her birthday. And she likes the melting pot. When you leave the melting pot, you bring melting pot with you. You smell like it, (laughs) right? And that's just not that big of a fire. Like these guys are thrown in there, and there is just no hint that they had been to the melting pot. Does that make sense? Like there's, they look, they're good. Well, here's the third truth. His faithfulness is greater than any fire. And let me add this to it. And it's in the fire. Please listen to this. It's only in the fire where you get to own his faithfulness. Oftentimes we think the fire is not part of God's plan. Oh, no. Read the Bible. They went into the fire knowing that God could deliver, but weren't sure if he could. And here's the deal. When you make kingdom decisions in your life, please listen to this. You will end up in the fire. Doesn't Peter talk about that? Brothers and sisters, don't think some strange thing has happened to you because you're going through trials and tribulations. We all go through this. Life is full of highs and lows for all of us. The apostle Paul said, I know what it means to abound and to be abased. I know about that stuff. His faithfulness is greater than and in the fire. The history of the church is written with the lives of those who died for their faith, who had just as much faith as Rad, Shack, and Benny, but who, like Stephen, saw God's faithfulness in it and through it. But when you make kingdom decisions in your life, his faithfulness is greater than the fire. When you live a compromised life, nobody wins. Everyone loses. See, whatever you trusted or whomever you trusted that leads you into a compromised life, they're an idol. An idol never produces what it promises. And you know my little seven alliterated things about most idols in life, not all, but You've heard these. When you take a good thing and make it a God thing, it robs the good thing of the thing that God intended it for. Say, what are those good things? See if I can remember them. Salary, status, sex, substance, situation, stuff, and sport. These are not bad things. These are good things. But when you make them your God, they rob you of the good that God intended them for. See, those seven good things are meant to bring an element of gratification to life, but they are incapable of bringing satisfaction to your life. 
Satisfaction of soul. Let me just share this with you. It's just my opinion as a 42-year-old guy. You only get a taste of it on this side of eternity. You're never fully satisfied until you finally go to the promised land. But where do you taste satisfaction? Where do you see, taste, and see that the Lord is good? That's where you find satisfaction of soul. But it's like manna. If you just say, well, I got saved in 1972. I haven't talked to Jesus since. Well, bro, there's no way that the wellspring of life is just feeding your soul. You need to come to that living water every single day. But one day, and I can't wait for that day, one day we'll see the face of the voice that we followed through this life. And I can't wait for that day. But here's the reality. God is faithful. But sometimes you have to walk through the fire to allow Christianity to move from the theoretical to the actual. And that's what God's doing. Well, let's wrap this up. He saw that the fire hadn't touched them. The ropes, that's what bound them. They were gone. And what does he say in verse 28? Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they should not serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Isn't Nebuchadnezzar intense? Look at verse 29. He's still a little rough around the edges. I make a decree that any people, nation, language, or speaks anything amiss from the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Good Lord. And their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Everyone's still in process in their sanctification, right? And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. God gets the glory and the people are set free. Three lessons this morning about lending themselves to countering culture. Choose to be good in what church? Good in, not good in, good. There's about eight of you that got it. I hope this week that that serves you well. Here's the second one. We can stand when we settle things beforehand, and his faithfulness is greater than the fire, and it's in the fire that you actually get to know his faithfulness. So don't run from the fire. Listen to me. The fire is your friend. The fire is where you're purified. God will not give you more than you can handle. Don't bail out. Allow him to, 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 to like take off that dross. Allow him to work in your heart. Because here's what I've learned about the fire. If you bail out too early, it's coming for you again. It's like having to repeat first grade. Does that make sense? Like, God still wants you to learn this lesson. If you don't do it now, it's coming for you. So here's the deal. These are not just life lessons for us. But I hope you see Jesus in this text before us. What do you mean by that? Jesus? He's the absolute best example. Who took the stand and was faithful unto the very end. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. How do we respond to this? I don't know. I'm not you. But you need to respond to this. You're accountable for this content now. What will you do with it? I don't know the intricacies of your life. I don't know what your next step is in following Jesus. Maybe you're here and you say, I don't even know Jesus. I need to get to know him. We have a next step for that. Maybe you're here and you know Jesus and you say, man, I'm not, I don't really plug into the gathering here. I kind of do what Billy Graham said. I just listen to the sermon and leave and he called that the greatest sin in America. Whoa, that's intense. Like I don't serve here. I don't give here. I just kind of come here every once in a while. Well, let's move forward. Take your next step. Maybe you say, man, I know Jesus, but you know, I've never publicly professed him. The biblical way to do that is to get baptized. Like, we would love as a church staff to be a part of you enjoying the life that God has for you. That new life in Jesus doesn't end with a salvation prayer. 
Someone once told me this, that the grace of God walking with Jesus, salvation is like a loaf of bread. Salvation is just the first slice. There's so much to life as a Christian. What is your next step? How do you respond? I think we're always in this place of realizing and recognizing who God is, repenting of sin, receiving his grace and releasing control of our life over to him. I think we're always in that place of confessing with our heart and believing, confessing with our mouth and believing in our heart, Jesus, your Lord. So let me share this last thing with, for you, and then Rob's going to come up and share a clear next step. Tomorrow, you have a day off most likely, right? President's Day, some of us. Some of us say no. Some of us have every day off, you know, like... But the church staff has tomorrow off. The school staff has tomorrow off. Some of us have to travel down to Merritt Island today to go to a regional Florida conference that we do every year. <sighs> However, in the last couple of weeks, we've made an adjustment to the staff culture. On Monday mornings at 9 a.m., we gather in this same place that you do to worship. Why? Because sometimes when you work at a church, you work at the church. Does that make sense? Like sometimes there's people that facilitate the things that we get to enjoy that they themselves don't get to enjoy. So on a Monday morning, we gather together and we do what you do. We sing. We learn God's Word. We, we watch daily in the Word. Has anyone ever heard of that? Some of you? You know, know a little bit about that? It's a labor of love for your church to go through every book of the Bible chapter by chapter. I hope you're using that resource. But we watch it as a staff. And then we do a little bit of popcorn. We don't bring, you know, we don't bring it. How did yesterday go? What could we have done better? What, how, what things should we be leaning into? And here's what we do. That's why I'm bringing this up. And then we want to pray for you. So you have a connect card in front of you. Here's something I'm asking. If you have something you would like to be prayed over or to praise God about, we as a staff would love to support you in that. So in just a moment, Rob's going to come up and share some next steps. The worship team's going to lead us in a chorus and a benediction. But here's what I would ask. Please don't allow these lessons to be lost on you. Please, please don't just sit here. Go, okay, yeah, 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 that's good. But man, we got President's Day. Hurry up. Lean into the next step that God has for you. What is that? I don't know. I'm not you. But I'm assuming that God's Spirit is faithful to speak to your heart. And here's what I know. There's always a next step with Jesus. The final step is, well done, good and faithful servant. We've all got a next step. What's yours? I want to encourage you to come and receive prayer when prayer teams are up here. Use that Connect card as a tool to let us know. We would love to be a part of your journey in following Jesus. Because I do believe as you follow Jesus, People are going to say, are you like a little Christ? Oh, there it is. That's what we're looking for. To go into the world and live on mission with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 